it's really only in the 1620s, 1630s, when the colonists start moving there with children, that you start seeing the rapid spread of these diseases, and it's it's the kids that are spreading them. Bless their little hearts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they were little Petri dishes back then, too. Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Professor Rebecca Dean to talk about the effects of culture and technology on epidemics. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED 53. So, a few notes about this episode. Um, yes, it is definitely inspired by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we are currently going through, but The Extra Dimension is not a show that's really set up to cover breaking news. I mean, this is a monthly show, and... Um, we try to do episodes that are evergreen so that, uh, you know, people coming back and listening months, years from now can uh, still, you know, get useful, interesting information out of it. So this will definitely not be a like comprehensive, up-to-date view of uh, COVID-19. If you're looking for that kind of thing, um, Ars Technica has a guide that they are regularly updating throughout the pandemic uh, with new information. So I've, I've put a link to that in the uh, show notes. Also, like health department's advice is constantly changing over time, so we're definitely not intending to be like giving anybody uh, advice on what they should be doing during our current uh, pandemic. Um, so that, with that said, this episode was recorded on April 29th, 2020. Uh, so that kind of helps to give you a sense of like where we were at when we had this conversation. And if you uh, happen to be listening to this episode after COVID-19 is no longer like a pressing concern for all of us, um, number one, I am super jealous. Uh, and number two, do you want do you want to like hang out with me at a park or something? Because um, I kind of miss getting to hang out with people who don't live in my own house. And if you're listening to this episode and you happen to be a, a student at U of M Morris, um, you should totally uh, go and take Rebecca's summer online course, uh, which is called Plagues, Peoples, and Persistence. Uh, and that was the reason that I um, invited her on to the show was because I found out that she was uh, teaching a class uh, about uh, about this kind of thing. And so um, hopefully this, this episode kind of serves as a super condensed introduction to the kinds of things that uh, that she'll be teaching during that course. So uh, I am Rebecca Dean. I am a professor of anthropology at University of Minnesota Morris. I teach classes in archaeology, which is the study of past cultures, and also in biological anthropology, which is the study of human evolution and human health and human ecology. So a lot of the courses that I teach kind of combine those perspectives. I'm looking at the past, but a lot of what I, my personal research is about is interactions between people and other animals and people and their environment. So that's where um, my focus on or interest in epidemics really comes from thinking about it as part of human ecology is part of the human environment. And that's like, that is really key to understanding epidemics, right? Because um, a lot of them have come from our close contact with other animals. Um, yes, is absolutely. That, is that like, is that mostly domesticated animals? So it can be any kind of animals. Um, there are so the it's, I guess it's not really a disease, but a one of, one of the earliest infestations that we have um, been able to track is actually almost two million years old, and it's um, pubic lice, huh. which we seem to have yes, which we seem to have caught from gorillas. Um, <laughs> So sometime around two million years ago, um, our 
human ancestors, you know, who used to be pretty furry all over, just like chimps, right? Uh, we lost our body hair, or rather I should say it receded. So it's only on our head and underarm and pubic area. And the body lice that were associated with our ancestors uh, were only living on the head. And we seem to have then contracted new pubic lice from gorillas. I don't think, obviously we weren't domesticating gorillas, not, especially not two million years ago, but still we were uh, in contact with those species. Or we like to think it's actually more that we may be contacted it from sleeping in gorilla nests. Mm. Yeah. So like so, the, I mean, the, the tabloid headlines that would be written about, you know, uh, <laughs> pu- right. pubic lice came from gorillas. That's probably not, it's not what you're thinking. Right, right. Get your get your head out of the gutter. That's not where it was. It's coming from. It's probably from the environment. Yeah, that's part of. Um, it, well, it, we just have to realize that our environment is full of animals, uh, and sometimes we don't even see them. So if you think about mice in your house, um, we can get lots of diseases from mice, um, and we may never see them. You know, other than maybe a few droppings or a fat looking cat, we may not realize that they're even there. Um, things like pigeons and mice and other uh, squirrels, animals that have colonized our um, towns really can spread disease. And so one of the things that I do, um, part of my research is on the earliest um, agricultural communities. So these are the first farmers in the world And as they start farming, they start settling down and founding small villages. And when they make villages, they make new environments. They're opening up environments that um, animals, other animals start to colonize. Um, And these animals are things like mice and pigeons and house sparrows. Uh, But it's also things like pigs um, that came into these neighborhoods thinking, hey, look, all of this trash lying around. Um, and obviously we'd love to get rid of the mice, but we took the pigs in because they're good eating. And, and so like the, this, this environment that we create for, you know, that other species kind of thrive in, um, does that, has that like resulted in us like, you know, across continents kind of encountering similar species within towns because like, because mice follow us and and have thrived in in our environments absolutely absolutely and so you can watch you can actually look in the archaeological record or fossil records at the spread of things like house mice that originally were from uh the middle east and have now spread Mm. throughout basically the whole world um and the same thing has happened with things like rats So if you look at the spread of the Black Plague, part of what you're looking at is the spread of both diseases, but also animals from the areas that the Mongols controlled um, on the old, the ancient silk routes. And these then start spreading um, into China, into Europe uh, in those Middle Ages. And so you're seeing the spread of disease there. And then, of course... Um, There are lots of diseases also from domestic animals. Um, More diseases probably come from domestic animals just because we have more contact with them. And we have sometimes the diseases spread because we give the disease to the animal and then they become a reservoir to hold that disease. So, for example, um, tuberculosis is has been a huge killer in human history. Right. Um, the, the form of tuberculosis we have, we have had a, a relationship with it that's about a million and a half years old. So that strain of tuberculosis that infects humans is uh, very ancient, much more ancient than the 10,000 years that we've had domestic animals. However, about 10,000 years ago when we domesticated cattle, one of the things we did is we gave cattle tuberculosis. That's not, and, that's not very nice of us. <laughs> no, it was not nice of us at all. And suddenly, if you let's say you have a village and it has 500 people, but it has another 100 or 200 head of cattle, uh, 
suddenly you have 700 entities, all of whom can carry tuberculosis, and you've increased that population, which means it's easier for a disease to become endemic in a population. It's easier for it to get rooted into that population and very hard to get rid of it. And so cattle were actually a main source of tuberculosis in human populations from 10,000 years ago until relatively recently. So is is the the tuberculosis that affects humans, um, does it also like affect cattle in adverse ways or are they like asymptomatic carriers? They they are affected. Um, and so they'll they'll cough it up. Uh, you know, you'll actually have coughing uh, cattle, they'll cough sputum, and then that sputum will um, get into people. Um, and before before we had ways of treating tuberculosis, and which wasn't that long ago. Um, in fact, my mother um, always tells me that one of her earliest memories, when she was maybe five years old, was lying in her bed, and her grandfather was holding her hand, and he was sobbing because she had just been diagnosed with tuberculosis and he had given it to her and he was certain that he'd killed her, right? She was going to die from it. But my mother, so this would have been in the early fifties. My mother was one of the first um, guinea pigs for the uh, medication we use today to treat tuberculosis. And she obviously survived. <laughs> so um, her grand, her, fa- her grandfather did not, unfortunately. Um, So up until the 50s, uh, we understood that cattle could give us tuberculosis, but we didn't know what to do about it. And so there would be mass kill-offs of herds if there was any tuberculosis found in cattle herds. And they would go and test um, sputum uh, that was coughed up by cattle. And if any uh, individual in the herd had tuberculosis, they would just slaughter the whole herd because they didn't know how else to prevent the spread. Do I do I remember correctly that there was like a similar response to like mad cow disease um when that started to pop up uh because like we didn't know how to really, you know, get rid of it right. to treat it. Um and so the only option was really to just like eliminate those herds. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. I was rather young at the time. I was going to say, that would be young. Yeah, you would have been young at the time because it, yes, definitely. There were a number, so a number of countries, um, their exports of beef were completely shut off um, because we didn't know um, whether some of these cattle might be carrying the disease. And it's um, that's one of those diseases that it sneaks into your brain and sits there for a long time potentially, before you show any symptoms. So there was concern. We didn't know how far it had already spread, right? Mm-hmm. We didn't, and and um, so yeah, there was mass slaughtering of any, any um, herds where cows had been diagnosed and the meat industry or export of meat in some countries was shut down completely. And sometimes we do we we have those kinds of responses when they're not even appropriate either. Like um, uh, the swine flu, which was you know kind of a misnomer. Uh, There there was uh, there was some hysteria around uh, getting rid of pigs. Right, right, absolutely. And this is of course there's a I'm I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear there's a long history of people blaming uh, the wrong the wrong groups, <laughs> the wrong animals, the wrong individuals, the wrong communities for disease. So if you, again, thinking about like the Black Death uh, in Europe, that led to many sustained and horrific um, acts of violence against the Jewish community in Europe. Um, not that they had anything to do with the disease other than being fellow victims of it, but um, because there was very little understanding of what was causing the disease, people went and blamed, you know, um, the Jewish communities and yeah, swine flu, the same thing. Let's, well, let's kill all the pigs. Okay. But that's not actually your problem. And I do think we see some of that today too, right? Let, um, insistence on calling it a Chinese virus or, um, insistence on closing the borders, um, uh, 
which is happening right now, but COVID 19s in the country, closing the borders doesn't help. It's a psychological um, action that helps maybe some people feel they have more control, that they're doing something, anything um, to help the situation. But the disease is in our country. We're closing the borders is not actually going to help in any way. Yeah. And, it, and it's always kind of, I mean, this is politics, so it's a game of optics, right? <laughs> and, you know, the optics of, of taking different approaches will play differently among different groups of people. Um, you and I, I think, uh, are a little bit more plugged into, like, what the scientists are saying, what ep epidemiologists, you know, are recommending um, versus, you know taking more of like a, a gut feeling approach of like what do i just kind of feel like will help um right and right yeah so wh wh who what wh where does the voting base uh s what what will sway them you know <laughs> it's yeah it's a good question um but there's certainly a long long history of this um because it's really only been relatively recently that we've understood where infectious diseases are coming from. Um, and if you think back not that long ago, you know, my parents' age, so boomer generation and, and earlier, infectious disease was a, a huge killer. Um, I think we've in some ways forgotten that, right? Mm. I think we've forgotten because now you get your shots and, you know, you get, even if you get a disease, you can get treatment for it, right? We have our antibiotics and, and that sort of thing. But um, I remember looking at my grandmother's family Bible and her mother had filled in the names of all her children and listed every childhood disease that they got. Mm. Uh, and so you can see, you could see the Spanish flu, um, going through the whole family. Um, they all survived, luckily. Um, you know, they got diphtheria, they got typhus, they got all kinds of things. And some of those diseases, um, like one of my great aunts had rheumatic fever and that killed her when she was, when she was in her 50s uh, because it weakens your heart. Um, a lot of diseases, even if they don't kill you, can cause infertility, they can cause damage to the lungs or internal organs. Um, and so if we think about sort of evolutionary factors that have shaped uh, human, the human species, infectious disease has to be one of the primary factors. And, and even um, beyond like, genetic evolution also the like the practices that are passed down from generation to generation right even if if a particular society didn't understand exactly what was causing a, a you know a particular spread of a disease if they happened to have practices that would mitigate that kind of thing then those practices are more likely to be passed on and practiced later on by other generations Absolutely. Can I tell you my favorite story about a biological and cultural adaptation? Please to do. <laughs> All right. So this is about malaria, right? So malaria continues to be one of the top infectious disease killers, right? We, we still have a really difficult time uh, getting control of malaria infections and treating them. And West Africa, the nations of West Africa, um, have very um, severe forms of malaria that people have dealt with for a very long time. Now, I think that there's a tendency to assume, oh, West Africa has always been a place where malaria has been a problem. And that actually turns out to be not true. Hmm. So the kinds of mosquitoes that cause malaria, um, they prefer to breed in shallow pools of water in sunlight. And much of West Africa um, is actually forested. So there's not a lot of sunlight, right? Well, around 6,000 years ago, which in archaeological terms is nothing, right? For me, that's recent history. Okay. So about 6,000 years ago, uh, people in West Africa start cutting down large parts of the forest in order to grow crops. 
and the populations rise. And clearing the, the forest for crops, you end up creating habitat for malaria carrying mosquitoes. So now suddenly malaria becomes a problem. So you have this cultural change, which is the adoption of agriculture, that causes a biological problem. Crap, now we're getting malaria, right? Well, uh, it actually turns out that um, malaria is one of the diseases that humans have biologically adapted to the most. There's a number of different blood factors that have evolved mostly in West Africa, um, but also in places like southern India um, to adapt people to malaria, to make us less susceptible to malaria. Um, and one of the most common that you might have heard of is sickle cell um, anemia, right? So sickle cell anemia is a really straightforward genetic condition. Um, if you have uh, two dominant genes in a particular location, two dominant alleles in a particular area of your genome, then um, you will have normal O-shaped blood cells. There is a recessive gene uh, mutation that will cause, will, will cause sickling. So it makes your uh, blood cells look, well, like a sickle, like a little C, right? And those sickle-shaped cells do not carry oxygen very well, and they also don't flow through our veins very well. So if all or most of your blood is that shape, unfortunately, it will cause early death. Um, even today, people who have full-on sickle cell anemia have a very hard time living past childhood. And that would be if you get both recessive genes from both of your parents. Right. And so that's a case of two recessive genes. Now, if you're very lucky, you might get one dominant gene from one parent and one recessive gene from the other parent. And in that case, most of your blood is the normal O shape, but some of it is C shaped. And in that case, you have some protection from malaria because the malaria, it basically, it can't colonize your blood cells um, because your blood isn't quite the right shape or there's not enough of it that's quite the right shape. And so it, it helps. Um, but even people with only some sickling blood do have uh, some some problems, right? Like with the flow of blood in their veins and it, it can cause damage to the kidneys. It can be a problem. All right. So now we have a biological adaptation in the form of sickle cell anemia, or rather I should say, um, sickle cell, um, sickling of some of your cells that allows you to be somewhat resistant to malaria. Great. But, uh, it turns out that um, one of the crops that people were growing in West Africa are yams. And these are not the sweet potatoes we eat. It's a different type of, of uh, plant, but yams. Yams have some natural chemicals in them that will actually protect people from the effects of sickled blood. Huh. They will actually, yeah, they will actually help blood flow in your veins. Um. And so people started growing more and more yams as a way of overcoming the problems with sickle-shaped blood. But what you see all over West Africa in different cultural groups, people with different languages, is that they have created a really interesting system where um, yams are stored and not eaten during the rainy season, which is when mosquitoes are most um, active and when you're going to have the most malaria cases coming out. But after that, in the dry season, when the dry season starts and malaria is less of a threat, they have huge yam festivals where everybody eats a ton of yams in order to, among other things, uh, overcome some of the problems of sickling blood. So you have this really interesting mix of cultural adaptations and biological adaptations all of which are about dealing with the fact that you're living in a high malaria environment. Which was in turn uh, exacerbated by an original cultural shift. Exactly. <laughs> the adoption exactly. of agriculture. Yeah. And, and so I that... Mean, one of... 
so and that didn't happen in other areas where agriculture was being uh adopted purely because like it wasn't a warm enough environment for this particular type of mosquito or right it wasn't the right environment for that mosquito now there were some other um there are some other diseases that become more problematic with agriculture typhus for example um is sometimes can come from um, fallow fields. And of course, with agriculture comes domestic animals, and a ton of our diseases are coming from domestic animals. Influenza, smallpox, mumps, measles, um, tuberculosis came from us, but we gave it to the domestic animals and they keep giving it back to us, right? So the gift that keeps on giving. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, agriculture was a serious problem. And you can see the difference between the Americas and Eurasia and Africa in the disease load that people carried. And it's a it reflects the difference in the kinds of domestic animals people had in Eurasia and Africa prior to what what we call the the Columbian germ exchange. Basically, when Columbus arrived in the Americas, he brought a lot of things. Well, not just him, right? The the Europeans in general brought all kinds of diseases like smallpox and TB uh, and diphtheria or whatever. Um, And there were very few indigenous diseases to the Americas. Uh, Yaws was the biggest one. I have never um, heard of that. Yeah, so it, it's more, it, it's kind of like leprosy. It's it's sort of in that um, type of, that type of a disease. Um, that was one of the few diseases. Uh, there's some argument about syphilis as being one of the few diseases that the Americas gave to Europe. Um, but in the Americas, there weren't very many domestic animals, and they don't appear to have carried very many diseases that humans got. But in Eurasia and Africa, we got a ton of diseases. So by the time you get, you know, Europeans coming to the Americas, they're carrying a huge load of diseases that they are, um, that, that most people in Europe are surviving in childhood. Right. They've been through waves of bubonic plague. They've been through waves of smallpox. Um, But they bring them to the Americas where people had not been having those problems. And this opens up a virgin population from an epidemiological perspective. And that's where you see the the spread of um, of horrific diseases through the indigenous population of the Americas. And that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in now is that like globally, the human population, we have not encountered this particular coronavirus before. Uh, and so we have no herd immunity built up. Right. And, and um, you know, so it's, it's kind of interesting. It, uh, diseases that are related can sometimes help us to develop some level of resistance. So, Right now, you hear a lot of people talking about how young children don't seem to be getting the this COVID-19, or at least don't seem to be suffering from it as much. One theory I've seen, which makes a lot of sense knowing what we know about the history of epidemics, is that because you know COVID-19, it's just one coronavirus. Coronaviruses include all the common colds. I have three children. I can tell you they get every damn cold that goes through this town. Um, every year, right? Children are just, they go to schools and these schools are just petri dishes of every coronavirus that's out there. And so there's some thought that perhaps one of the reasons children seem to be able to to uh, sort of, you know, not get as sick with COVID-19 in general is because they have had their immune systems tested recently by a lot of coronaviruses. You can also look at things like, um, the Spanish flu, right? The Spanish flu was a was a huge killer um, in the early 1900s, and that was the opposite. There were very few older people who got really sick. It tended to hit people in their 20s and 30s and younger, and we're fairly certain that some 
related strain of flu had gone through the population 20 or 30 years earlier than the Spanish flu, so that the adults or the, the older adults um, had some level of resistance to it. They'd already been exposed to it. Um, but that original um, strand or strain of the flu was never remarked upon at the time. It originally wasn't that bad. It was later when it came back that it was uh, so particularly virulent. The 1918 flu epidemic comes up a lot as a comparison for an outbreak that played out very similarly to our current one. Um, and that is true in some ways. Um, I, I've been reading a lot of articles about uh, cities that uh, implemented like social distancing measures and uh, made it mandatory for people to wear masks whenever they uh, went out in public. Um, and so those kinds of things, you know, they, they were attempting to flatten the curve in a very similar way uh, to what we are currently doing, uh, at least in the United States. Um, but at the same time, uh, it is a, a pretty different scenario um, because we now, uh, in 2020, have a lot more technology that allows people to get a lot of stuff done without actually having to go out into public spaces, right? Um, a, a large portion of our uh, workforce is able to um, get the, their work done from home by connecting to um, their, you know, employers like networks uh, over the internet and uh, and collaborating on um, the, the work that they're doing um, via you know online tools um, that is definitely not true for everybody's job um, but a, a much larger portion of our economy can be uh, can still function um, without people actually having to physically be at a particular location and so that is going to uh, inspire the uh, next couple of episodes of The Extra Dimension. Um, we'll be uh, talking about distance learning um, because I, as a high school teacher, that's what I've been going through over the last month, uh, is uh, I've been you know, in the trenches making sure that all of my classes work uh, as uh, online only, um, and, uh, and I'll be interviewing a bunch of other teachers and students and parents uh, about what their experiences have been with this whole process. Uh, and then uh, the episode after that, uh, we'll talk about remote working for, you know, adults. So be sure to subscribe to The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player so that you don't miss those episodes. Well, you know, what's interesting is in some ways we're going back to older ways of dealing with infectious disease. So, the, you know, for us, this is strange, right? I have never been in a situation where I've been told stay home, uh, you know, lest you get some horrible disease. But actually, even our grandparents would have experienced quarantines um, and certainly from the period of the Black Death in Europe on, the idea of quarantining to avoid the spread of disease uh, was well known. And so people recognized quite early that if you try to avoid contact with people who are sick, that would help you not get sick. I mean, they had no, under they had no understanding of viruses or germs or any of that, but they understood about... Um, preventing contact. And there were a number of, of villages or towns that um, cut off all contact, including some which closed off um, their borders, knowing the disease was already there, mm. uh, not to protect their town, but to protect any other towns, right? To keep the the disease quarantined within their own town so it didn't spread further in the region. So people f truly understood um, that that was an issue. So, yeah, we're kind of in a lot of ways going back to a typical way of dealing to with disease that people for the last, well, almost thousand years would recognize. Which is, yeah, really unfortunate because like a week after this uh virus was identified right they had gotten the entire genome sequenced you know they they knew exactly how to test for this virus um you know we just had to kind of uh 
ramp up capacity for for testing that kind of thing and definitely still haven't uh ramped up enough but like yeah it's it and and some and some countries have been able to like you know remain keep a some semblance of of normalcy in their day-to-day lives um but you know still being able to properly like uh figure out who you know who needs to be quarantining with in in their own households and who doesn't and um you know not every country has been able to pull that off we we do have the technology to much more effectively track people and uh and know like who they came into contact with throughout their days weeks you know the lives that they're leading um but of course that's a super thin line to walk from a couple of different standpoints right uh number one there's the privacy standpoint so any system that we use for this has to walk a line between being, you know, useful, gathering enough information to actually uh, make a difference, but also uh, to, you know, not invade people's privacy um, and and give like governments or other central agencies uh, too much information about people. And there's a lot of different examples of uh, um, different systems that, um, you know, different governments are using. Um, Google and Apple recently announced that they are collaborating on a system that will work uh, on all um, Android and iOS devices, um, although those devices do need to be new enough to have uh, the proper hardware, the the Bluetooth, uh, low-energy Bluetooth uh, hardware, to make it work. Um, And that brings up a a second concern, is that... um, from an equity standpoint, this kind of system needs to be uh, deployed in such a way that it is not leaving anybody behind, right? And um, so th- this this uh, Bluetooth system that Google and Apple have proposed um, is like it, it will work on almost any smartphone that was manufactured within like the last five years or so, um, but when you when you zoom out from the United States and consider like the entire global population, um, there is a significant number of people who are either using phones that are much older than that, smartphones that are older than that, or even just don't use smartphones at all and they just have like feature phones. Um, so that kind of thing um, is uh, definitely a concern. As a, as a general rule, I would say that. So the spread of a of any kind of infectious disease, right? It, it's the relationship. It, it comes down to the relationship between that disease and its environment. And when you're talking about a disease that hits humans, the cultural context is part of the environment. And often, when we see um, mass death or mass uh, destruction as a result of a disease. You know, it partly, of course, it's the disease's fault, but a lot of it tends to be failures of cultural systems um, as opposed to um, an, an inevitable biological interaction between people and this particular disease. So I think I, I'm not saying I know exactly what all the governments should or shouldn't do related to COVID-19, but you can certainly look into the past and see that, um, you know, the, the spread of disease, say, in the Americas, people did not know in the 16th, 17th century how diseases spread, but they knew that contact could spread them. And so the spread of diseases to indigenous populations included deliberate attempts by European colonists to spread those diseases, right? So the the smallpox blankets where they would take uh, clothing or, or blankets used by uh, victims of people who are sick with various diseases and then give them to indigenous communities as gifts or whatever and um, end up deliberately infecting communities that had no immunity to these diseases. Um, It's interesting to look at that spread. I mean, in North America, in some ways, the disease spreads uh, were much worse than they might have been, partly because European colonists uh, were there with their children. Mm. And it's children who carried most of those diseases. 
So you can see, for example, that uh, there's contact between indigenous populations in the northeastern part of the United, what is today the United States, right? Um, starting in the 1500s, you, there there's some extent contact, and you do see some diseases being spread. Um, the pilgrims, for example, when they arrived in Massachusetts, they found a landscape that had been abandoned partly because um, the people who had lived there had fallen victim to an epidemic uh, within the year year or two before. But it's really only in the 1620s, 1630s, when the colonists start moving there with children, that you start seeing the rapid spread of these diseases, and it's it's the kids that are spreading them. Bless their little hearts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they were little petri dishes back then too. But so the so the cultural context really matters, right? If if you are there with your kids to found you know farmland, that's different from if you are there to try to mine, if you're just a bunch of, I don't, you know, single men there to mine gold or whatever, mm -hmm. it, it is a, the, the context and purpose of the colony mattered in terms of how disease was spread at the time. And, and there can be all kinds of interesting cultural history that leads to various uh, cultural practices um, that can impact disease spread. So you think about Europe and the fact that the bubonic plague spreads through rodents. Um, well, one effective way to keep the rodent population down is to have cats, right? Well, Europe didn't have as many cats as they could have, partly because cats were associated with witchcraft. And witchcraft, of course, was something that you could get burned at the stake for. So people didn't keep as many cats as they could have. And witchcraft was, or cats were associated with witchcraft because they were associated with the Egyptian goddess Isis back at the end of the Roman Empire. Um, and the cult of Isis was one of the major sort of rivals for early Christianity as a important religion in the Roman Empire. So you can say, well, the the rise of the cult of Isis in Egypt in 100 AD is somehow important to understanding why a third of Europe died from bubonic plague, right? It, it's, it's kind of a butterfly flaps his wings chaos theory, right, of, of the world. Um, but uh, we don't always know what aspects of our cultural systems are going to impact disease spread mm -hmm. and and also like kind of sometimes tracing back things that we take for granted now you know tracing those back to oh it it had some cause it made some sense at a particular time in the past um even though right. like the thing that that created that particular cultural artifact isn't with us anymore exactly exactly Sometimes you can look at that and think, why are we doing this again? You know, and the answer can sometimes be because we used to do it for a good reason. Now we are not, but we've never stopped and rethought this from, from basic principles, right? We've never stopped and asked ourselves, is this what we should be doing? I guess the only other thing I would really like to emphasize is that the the cultural context can be so important in creating the conditions that make diseases inevitable or to make them spread easily. And that may not have been the intention, but it's something that, that we have to watch. I mean, so disease spread can come from a lot of, of causes um, and anything that makes people's health generally more fragile is going to create um is going to to open the conditions or create the conditions for more disease spread and so in modern context perhaps you're looking at that like well what about the the health system 
in different countries could make people or some communities within those countries more vulnerable to disease, right? Are some people not getting fully served by our health system? Are some people not getting access to preventative care? Uh, are some people not getting a f sufficient access to nutritious food? Things like that. So conditions like poverty um, are really important uh, for understanding how susceptible somebody is to disease. And you can look at historical cases. Um, I often use the example of the Irish potato famine, okay. right, where you've got this potato blight. It's going through Ireland in the 1840s. It's, yes, people did not have enough food, but it was only the peasants who didn't have enough food. Ireland actually was exporting food throughout the entire famine. The only food that was really affected were potatoes, but potatoes were the main source of food for the um, Celtic Irish peasants, the non-landowners. And since the landowners were unwilling to share their surplus, they essentially let their workers die. Um, a lot of people did die. A lot of people left. But most of them didn't die from starvation. They died from disease. So what ends up happening is you create these conditions for um, where disease can spread really easily. Mm. Um, and when people lost their land, when they lost their livelihoods, they often had to go to workhouses and other sorts of institutions where they put all of these vulnerable people all together in bad conditions with inadequate food and health care, and they, they died in droves. And so we need to recognize that there are – people make decisions. They may be political decisions. They may be cultural decisions. They may be based on class or race or whatever, religion. Um, people make decisions about who's going to get help and who's going to have the, the resources that they need – to be able to be healthy through the middle of a pandemic. And I mean, an infectious disease will kill people. If it's, if it's a deadly disease, it will kill people regardless of, you know, age, sex, race, class. But some people are going to be more vulnerable than others. And that vulnerability is the result of, of our choices. It's not the result of the disease itself. Right. Yeah, thinking about our our current context, um, that definitely brings to mind that like, you know, as many jobs as possible are doing like work from homes right now, but the types of jobs that where it's possible to actually work from home, uh, are are quite often like higher paying, uh, you know, and and so all of the essential workers who have to take the bus to go and work at the grocery store or at a retail job, right? Those are, you know, the, the that's the class of, of employment that those people have always been kind of like left by the wayside in almost every difficult situation that society finds itself in. And, right. And it's really bad. <laughs> that's a bad <laughs> it, thing. <laughs> well, right. Out, out here in Western Minnesota, we're really worried right now about all the meat packing plants and dairies, mm. right? I mean, we're watching the spread of COVID-19 in those contexts, both here in Minnesota, but also South Dakota and, Ida and, and Iowa and crossing the border near right. us. And again, you know, it, it, it's people um, who are lower income, right? Who have frankly been screwed over a lot of times, um, but also around here, a lot of the people who work in these conditions are immigrants, Somali immigrants, Latin American immigrants, right? And so um, they're they're vulnerable on a whole lots of, lot of levels. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like th those kinds of things are very easy to identify, and also like um, you know, like it's it's very easy to look at our healthcare system where the coverage is based on having. A job and like right. now we are in a situation where lots of people are encouraged to stay home and a lot of like jobs have just disappeared over the last few weeks and like so we're in the middle of a pandemic 
and people don't have health care coverage. That's a recipe for goodness, right? Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're very aware of the fact that like um, – global the global like traveling uh economy right is is makes it easier for for you know a disease that was first identified in late december in china to all of a sudden be worldwide in you know less than a month um so like you know and and some things you know we we definitely uh have been willing to give up and other things we haven't been willing to give up um and uh yeah so it's it's a whole negotiation with with between us and our environment and us and each other and you know that social contract of okay it's fine for me to go and uh, take a bike ride every day to you know act like just have a a change of environment so i'm not having to be in the same house all the time but when I go out, I need to be aware of like, am I passing other people too close? Uh, you know, et cetera. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are you sure you're not an anthropologist? <laughs> <That's> exactly <laughs> how we would think about it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a it's a negotiation, right, between the various aspects of our community and and us as individuals, and as you say, the social contract and. I, what are we what are we going to say is essential right so apparently now we're saying having meat is essential well i i, mean, I, I think we could argue about that is right. it right couldn't we get by on beans right and tofu right so um it, it is a really interesting conversation to have but i think you know one thing i take hope from looking at the past is that humans are really resilient i mean i'm not saying oh great Pandemics are wonderful, but they do cause innovation. People do bounce back, right? Um, and so I, I think that the the takeaway you could take from looking at the history of epidemic disease in in um, well in humans is that we have we are we're smart, we're flexible, we try new things. Um, and all of those characteristics come out when we're faced with new challenges, including pandemics. And so you see the development of biological adaptations, but also cultural adaptations, technological adaptations to try to help people to try to come back from these diseases. I saw, yeah, a, a comic uh, in XKCD recently that, um, you know, had a, a very hopeful spin on this whole thing that like um it, it was written from the perspective of a few viruses that were talking about humans and you know the conclusion of the of the comic was like we're not trapped in here with them they're trapped in here with us um and yeah i saw that one it's, nice yes it's a very Absolutely. good comic <laughs> yes <laughs> one of my favorites yeah Yep, yeah, we, we will survive, right? We will survive. It's just we we are resilient. It just it's uh, it it's not something we want to go through, but we're, it's not the end of the world. Right. Yeah. And and hopefully learn something from the experience, set up systems that you know in the future can mitigate this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what's fascinating is to think about what's going to be different. Right. You know, I've been teaching on Zoom. I assume you've been doing long, you know, online teaching. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. <laughs> but, but, you know, are, are we going to continue to do some of those things? How how are things going to change? Um, will my 13 year old be able to tell her grandchildren that she remembers a time when you could go into restaurants and sit in chairs next to people instead of being six feet away from them or whatever, right? Like, I mean, how are things going to change? I think that that's really a fascinating thing to think about. And a lot of it could be relatively small cultural practices, like staying a little further away from each other, not shaking hands, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, we might end up, uh, you know, in a future where, uh, like, some college age kid is is interviewing me while I'm in my fifties and asking like, "Hey, you were you were alive like during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Like, tell me what that was like." Right. <laughs> Absolutely. 
That could happen. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I mean, if you think about the Spanish flu, mm-hmm. right, which is our most recent, really horrific worldwide pandemic, that story was not widely told for a whole host of reasons. I mean, among other things, we call it the Spanish flu, even though there's a good chance it started in Kansas, right? Right. Um, and it's all and, about... And, the, and the, the reason that I've heard that it was called the Spanish flu is very fascinating um, because it was in the middle of World War One that it started spreading. And most of the countries that were involved in the war didn't want to like seem weak by admitting that they were struggling with an outbreak. But Spain was neutral, so they didn't have any of that like you know, uh, yeah. looking tough, you know, kind of overhead. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, the U S um, the U S actually sent a congressman to, um, to jail for f- something you know, like 15 years for speaking too much truth in a way that they thought would undermine the war effort. Mm. Um, there were, you know, uh, newspapers here, in the U.S. that were trying to publish, oh, by the way, horrific death tolls from this flu, um, that were essentially told, you will publish headlines that say, this is just a normal flu, no worse than your average flu season, um, or we will shut you down and send you to jail. And so, yeah, I mean, I think um, there are things we have learned from this and will continue to learn. And I think one of the things we learned from the Spanish flu was it's best not to deny that it's happening <laughs> at the time, right? Think of how many people might have been saved if there'd been more national leadership around quarantines and keeping people safe. And I think that that's, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out here as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, I, I think we're probably a little bit like, so. so definitely it's easier to get information, right? You know, for the average citizen, but it's also, I think we've gone a little bit farther into the, it's also possible. It's very easy to get a lot of misinformation. Um, and so I, the only solution to that problem that I can think of is to like educate the population on proper ways to vet, like, you know, where's my information coming from? Is this a reliable source, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which is, you know, a skill that, like, definitely I, I teach my high school students, you know, today in, in 2020. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of us who, like, grew up when the internet was just becoming a thing or who grew up before that, like, that's not really a skill set that we really needed as much. Because, right. you know, if, if information was available to us, that means it was probably published which means right. that it had to go through some vetting. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's something, again, yeah, at the college level, we continue to work on. Like, who is telling you this supposed fact? And what's their agenda? And what's their expertise? And do you do you think this is a good idea? I mean, some of it could be helped with basic biology, right? Um, disinfectants kill viruses... Um, very efficiently. But the reason we don't use them internally is they will also kill you. Right. Right. Like that's a basic biology fact. Um, But then there are things like, you know, penicillin that like, frankly, so many of these, these things that we rely on for modern medicine were discovered within like the last hundred, 150 years. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, we, we've had very few like, big outbreaks to test these these you know systems against um yeah yeah i don't know exactly where i'm going with that but (laughs) (laughs) no it's true though yeah i mean it's true i mean because vaccination is so effective right um and it it is probably uh, my my uh, husband used to teach a class on the um on the ethics of technology okay. right, for the computer science program here at Morris. And um, he would go around and ask students what's the most important piece of technology to you, like personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and he always gave the answer his uh, glasses. Okay. Right. Um, but I would always say vaccinations. 
because they have saved so many people <laughs> in the world. Yeah, the tech side is not really my forte, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, and, I, I like the biology side. <laughs> yeah, and and given that, like, I mean, the the scientific process and technological progress, like, because it operates on an exponential scale, like m most of the like diseases that we just talked about, like the, the, the scientific knowledge on how to combat them was, you know, from our perspective, static. Uh, right. Whereas like within the last 150 years, that's when suddenly, okay, now we know how to deal with Right. a bunch of different diseases and we can eliminate smallpox and like polio is no longer a concern and tuberculosis who even gets that anymore yeah right, right. <laughs> yeah i mean it's funny because like even just in the mid 1800s right they were doing some things right they were doing quarantines they knew that like willow bark would lower fevers and things mm. like that sure those are all correct but, you know, the idea that you should wash your hands was often <laughs> was like, oh, no, why would anybody do that? You know, they were still at that stage. To be entirely honest, they were still at the stage of, you know, strangle a black rooster and put it under your bed for the night, you know, to try to treat certain diseases. So. Yeah. And I think mid mid 1800s, is that when the uh, there was like an outbreak of something in London and like one person managed to like track it down to, Oh yeah. Yeah. There's like this one specific well that like everybody who got this disease, that's where they got their water from. Um, right. And like nobody else believed him at, at first. Right. Right. He tried to get them to, t to shut down the well and they're like, whatever, that's stupid. But yeah, it was a cholera outbreak. So it's the mid 1800s. You start to see, these studies saying, oh, hey, if you dissect a dead body and then go on to deliver a baby without washing your hands, you could spread disease. If, you know, the disease can spread through wells in London, things like that. And you start, you start to see more scientific approaches to medicine. Right? Yeah. And you can't, I mean, Thank God. you can't really <laughs> blame people for that because, like, so many of these diseases spread in different ways. So it's mm -hmm. like... You know, how how do you wrap your head around the fact that, like, one approach for one thing isn't going to work for another thing? Um, right. And, you know, right. like, yeah. we are in a very fortunate situation now where it's like, okay, very quickly we were able to figure out that, okay, like, SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory infection you know it it uh spreads via like um droplets that can you know travel approximately six feet if somebody sneezes right. and you know so like very quickly we were able to get like i mean <laughs> from from my perspective here in in uh late april like we were able to figure out proper right. you know like ways of of dealing with it um Talk to me in a month and maybe maybe there will be different <laughs> recommendations, right? right? I mean, yeah, right. like the, uh, an example of that actually would be like masks. Should we wear masks out, out in public, right? The CDC at first was, you know, telling us, no, that doesn't really like help you at all. Um, only wear a mask if you know that you're sick. And uh, and now it's like, well, OK, yeah, everybody wear a mask when you're out. Right, so. right. And that's going, there's a whole bunch of interesting factors that like went into that, right? The, their concerns about causing shortages and their concerns mm -hmm. about causing panic, but also the actual science wasn't clear. And I mean, it, so it's interesting, but you're right. Like it wasn't that long ago that any disease would have been diagnosed entirely on symptoms. We would have had very little understanding of what was causing it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now, as you said, we, we know that we have, we can sequence all the genes within, <laughs> within a month or so, and we know everything. We don't know how to stop it, but that's a different issue. We don't, or rather to say, we don't know how to vaccinate against it. Right. And if you do look at places like South Korea have done a great job of testing, um, and they can keep, they have schools open, you know, they have businesses open. They just, as soon as there's an outbreak, they can close things down and keep it from spreading but they can do that because they're testing so extensively so yeah yeah oh well <laughs> someday maybe here i can hope anyway
Well, yeah, and, and I mean, um, one of the reasons that I've heard cited that like um, that so many countries in like Southeast Asia have done a really good job with their responses is because they set up systems after the SARS outbreak. Um, right. So they learned from that. The rest of us didn't have to mm-hmm. deal with that, so we didn't set up the cultural and, I mean, more governmental systems, right, um, to deal with that kind of thing. So since this is a global issue now, like, hopefully we'll all learn something from it. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. I think that's that's a huge and, – and things like, you know, the, as you say, the government system is critical, but also just the cultural expectations. Um, having been through this, a lot of parts of East Asia were like, oh, back to the masks, right? Um, but also, it's also a cultural um, norm there that if somebody is sick to wear a mask so that they, you know, it's politeness. And here, I mean, I'm actually seeing a lot of sort of, it, it's being, the, the idea of wearing a mask is being, um, is coming up against ideas of of uh, gender norms, Right. Uh, is it not masculine enough to wear a mask? Mm. I, I'm seeing issues related to race where African Americans are concerned about wearing masks because they're afraid that they'll be seen as threatening and then have the cops called. I mean, there's all kinds of really interesting cultural aspects to this, and um, it's it's kind of fun. I mean, not fun. Yeah, fun, fun is perhaps not the right word. But fascinating. Let's yeah. go with fascinating. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. Our guest today was Rebecca Dean. You can find her on the University of Minnesota Morris website under the Anthropology Department. Or you can find her on Twitter at Rebecca underscore M underscore Dean. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck with no underscores. This episode of The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any or all of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which again is thenexus.tv slash TED53. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can do so on our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can uh, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. Just like Quentin Pongratz did, he is one of our patrons at The Nexus Tier, uh, which uh, entitles him to get a shout-out at the end of all of our episodes. You can find that and lots of other cool perks on our Patreon. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological Convergence. Convergence. You are about to become obsolete. You think you are special, unique, and that whatever it is that you are doing is impossible to replace. You are wrong. As we speak, millions of algorithms are frantically running on servers all over the world, with one sole purpose. Do whatever humans can do, but better. But all is not lost. Look for the audiobook, Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, at thenexus.tv, or by searching in your favorite podcast player.